Hi, my name is Betty Mullally Moulton and I'm from Gander, Newfoundland. September the 11th, uh, I was a social worker working with uh, the Military Family Resource Centre and Nine Gander. I guess the biggest understanding for me was that the level of cooperation and the level of preparedness that, that was exhibited that day. And I think that it's important to realise that this level of preparedness was something that had been accumulated for decades in Gander, from airplane crashes where we developed systems such as the emergency operations centres that would be activated at the airport. We built up our partnerships and we built the capacity to respond to any large-scale emergency between you know, the mid-80s to the early 90s. There were thousands of refugees who came into Gander. We're coming to Canada. We were the first point of entry from Europe. You want to see an immigration officer? Yeah. These refugees were from you know, countries that spoke different languages to Maui. They had different cultural backgrounds. They had different religious ideologies. But they were greeted in such a respected and um, caring manner. And I think that's important for people to recognize. There was always a community capacity that was built over decades that allowed us to not only welcome and provide kindness and caring and social integration, but also to coordinate a large scale response in a very short time frame. Welcome back to Connecting Through Gander, our special coverage of 9-11 20 years later. I'm Anthony Germain. It's difficult not to think back two decades and remember the horror and the sorrow and the grief from everything that was lost on that day. But in the aftermath of destruction, two strangers managed to find a life of happiness. He was an oil industry worker heading to Houston from the UK, and she was a mom from Texas who was heading back after visiting her son. They were put in the nearby town of Gambo for five days and 20 years later, Nick and Diane Marzen join me now from Houston. Nick, let me start with you. How did you two become a couple? We were confronted with this looping news, which was distressing uh, to look at. So another couple, and I, I uh, latched onto Diane because we were on the same flight and so forth. Another couple and us, we decided to go for a walk and discover what was around. And the other couple, the lady had the uh, sandals and the gravel got in her feet, so they turned back. And we carried on and we spent the rest of the day chatting because we come from very, very different backgrounds. Yeah. And so we had a lot of uh, things to talk about. Yeah. At what point did it become clear that there was a, a relationship here happening and then a marriage? It, 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 <laughs> over the course of those few days, it, it um, grew slowly. Uh, yeah. But, but we, we'd been taken care of, um, having fed us and given us somewhere to sleep. Um, those wonderful Newfoundlanders uh, started entertaining us. And uh, there was a screeching ceremony the one evening. And uh, that's where lightheartedly Diane had offered to marry me. Well, they, um, they, the master yeah. ceremonies thought we were married yes. because we'd been sitting together and chatting and such. So, and so, so when he found out we weren't married, he said, well, I'm a justice of the peace. Or, um, would you like to be married? And Diane lightheartedly went, uh, well, why not? Why not? It, and, and I'm we, thinking, well, you know, I that might work. Out. Well, we were in a place <laughs> that was heaven. We were taken out of these troubled skies and we landed on an island in a town with so many wonderful people and they were doing everything they, they could. They brought food from their pantries, from their refrigerators to feed us those first couple of days. They yeah. sent lunches out to the, the yeah. plane while we were still on it. The diapers for the babies, formula. They were just taking care of all of our earthly needs. Yeah. Now, I understand you have both come back to Newfoundland a number of times to remember your honeymoon, celebrate your anniversary. And I'm told you have seen come from away how many times? 118. <laughs> 118? Yes. Uh, and I, and when, when people look at us thinking, well, yeah, we know, we know now they're crazy. It, <laughs> Diane's response to that is that it, it's kind of like we're renewing our vows every time we see it. Yeah, yeah. It takes us back to that happy time not that we're not happy now, but it takes us back to that first rush of feelings for mm -hmm. someone. And so many couples come up to us after the, the show from the audience 
and it has taken them back to that time when they met their special someone. Yeah. Yes. It, it reminds you of love. And I think the love flowed from those people who were like angels taking care of us. Well, finally, I would like both of you to settle an age old question here for everybody watching in Canada about destiny. Uh, Diane, you were in your 60s. Nick, you were in your 50s. Was what happened 20 years ago, was, was that fate? Oh, I, we, I we, definitely, we believe so. Yeah, I we definitely believe so. think so. Diane hadn't a kiss me on the school bus going back to the airport. I'd probably still be in <laughs> well, England now. I figured that was my last chance because <laughs> yeah. we were going back to the airport to fly to Houston. Uh, we were never going to see each other again. Yeah. So and she played a race. Yes, I played my ace card. I, I see. Well, Diane, you must be one heck of a kisser. Uh, listen, it's been a pleasure talking to both of you. Thank you for sharing such a, a wonderful story during such a dark time. Really appreciate that. It's really extraordinary. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So Nick uh, kisses a cod, kisses Diane, and then the rest is history. I want to ask you both a question about the relationships that were founded in those intense five days here. Uh, what kinds of relationships are you aware of, Gina? For me, it, it wasn't so much the relationships I formed at 9-11. It was the ones that I've subsequently um, had the fortune of being a part of. We've had so many people come here from all over the world mm -hmm. as a result of what happened here. We have had people come here from various museums commemorating 9-11, people with PTSD, first responders, and they're in pain. And they're coming to Gander and the surrounding areas because it's a, a, almost a healing. I, one woman said to me, I had to come here because I had to touch love. And so there's this kind of relationship that you build with these people as they try to connect with you. And those are the relationships I have the pleasure of having now. And sir, you know what happened to so many first responders in the United States and New York and in Washington that horrible day. Um, Brian, you must know of some people as an educator who keep coming back. They do, and uh, people want to come back to where they were. <clears throat> they, you know, they were close to each other over those days, and they were, you know, in a, in a high school you'd have 400 and something people. In the, the elementary school here you had almost 700, I think over 700. So you get to know each other really well. And people have come back, and it's coming back to the people that they feel that they really connected with over those five days. And you know, the relationships are there, they're strong, and it's from the comfort and love. And I guess, you know, as you're actually together, eating together in a place, in this island in the middle of the Atlantic you know nothing about, must be a lot of curiosity, you ask a lot of questions, and, and you make friendships. You do. Right. All right, now, one of the interesting things that happened, of course, 20 years ago, was we know there were a lot of Americans who were here, and there were also people from many different countries, from just about every continent, almost 95 people, or people from 95 different countries, rather. And some people will tell you that people in Newfoundland and Labrador speak English slightly differently, and sometimes not everybody understands what's being said. Well, you can imagine with so many people whose English wasn't their first language, language was something of a challenge. Hi, my name is Sheila Coates. On um, September 11th, I was living in, uh, in Appleton in central Newfoundland. The passengers on those flights were not necessarily all Americans. In fact, for several that we had at the hall, English wasn't their first language. For some of them, it wasn't a language that they had any facility in at all. There was one man, the guy in the white shirt. Again, I have no idea what his name was. 40-ish man and you know he seemed to be sort of wandering around on his own as well and of course I'm trying to communicate with him and it's not happening he's he's just smiling and nodding at me. I remembered a, a family in Gander who had emigrated here uh, post-war. He had worked at the airport so I asked Mr. Manko if he could come out to Appleton just cold called him. I asked Mr. Manko could you could you speak to him could you try to say hi and he did. And this gentleman, his eyes lit up. I, mean, I shivers even still thinking about that moment. And they reached out and held each other's hands for the longest time. And like he was fine, he was talking to somebody who knew everything he was saying. From that moment on, every time he saw me, he put his hand up on his heart. He was over watching another couple gentlemen play chess. So I ran to a friend's house and got a chess board. And of course, the night that they all left, they had the windows down on the bus and the rain was 
pouring over the windows and the last thing that I can think from that night was that gentleman from Northern Europe on the bus with his hand up on his chest saying goodbye to me. And I remember after the bus, the last bus left, we came back in the hall and we all sat here and we just hugged each other and cried. I'm Anthony Germain, welcome back. Well, not far from this international airport, you'll find all kinds of statues of aircraft, as well as old aircraft that are positioned in interesting places and a museum. Now in Newfoundland, when something big happens, one of two things happens. A, a great singer comes up and writes a song about it, or B, a very clever artist decides an interesting way to commemorate it. Have a look. Since I started uh, making public art, so about five years ago. I have seen there's many wire planes around Gander because of course it's a aviation town. Um, I've seen those planes and I have said you know I'd really love to get my hands and my yarn on those. This year the uh, anniversary came up or was coming up and I, I thought that it would just be a great opportunity to 
work with the town to offer something different. So I'm using doilies. Um, I'm going to string for every doily, I'll attach uh, probably six to 12 strings and then I'll be able to affix them and tie them on to the sculpture of the plane. It'll be very reminiscent of spider webs. So, you know, the idea behind it all is that there's a web of connections that was made through all these people who came to Gander at that time. Uh, but then there's also the, the web of the community that embraced them during that. I think it's important for art to be accessible. So I think this is an event where we're caught up in the storm of COVID and distancing and uh, difficulty being around one another, but this is an opportunity for everybody in town to celebrate the history of Gander in general as like an aviation community, but also uh, the, the warmth and hospitality that they brought to the world when everyone was really frightened it was such a scary time, you know, and they're like in the moment, nobody knew really what was happening, but it's pretty amazing the kindness that was rolled out to people in Gander. That's the sort of stuff that I was thinking about in wanting to make a public art display. Now, Nina's work was designed to actually show the connections. And as we discussed, uh, Gina and Brian, you had these intense connections for five days and then all of a sudden people were gone. What was that like? It, it was an incredible time, and, and as has been referred to, it wasn't just Gander. They came to Gander, but they went to Gambo, Appleton, Glenwood, North Arm. Important point. Uh, Lewisport. And there was this energy associated with all of these people. It was beautiful weather. No matter where you looked, people were everywhere. And then when they left, it was gone. And so our experience was different here in that the tragedy of 9-11 really for Gander was the story of 9-12. It was what we had to do to take care of all these individuals and when that energy left we kind of lost something. So there was this sorrow to see all our friends go. And it happened so quickly. I mean you have these, this, this compressed time where you're trying to make everything work and welcome all of these people, take care of them, getting to know them and then suddenly you've got to find ways to get them going because pressure is to get back home. Uh, Brian, what was that like for you? I've heard the line deafening silence used so many times because we were go, 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 go. No time for yourself. You didn't have time. You were doing this, doing that, doing this, getting this ready, you know, and their needs were yours and yours had to sit in the background. And then as quickly as they arrived, they yeah, left. And now all of a sudden you went to these crowded places for five days and now it's, it seemed emptier than before. And the silence was absolutely deafening. It was, it was, hard to get your head around because you reverted blip right back to where you were. Right, and I guess there's sort of a collective sigh of relief, but yeah. also, oddly enough, a sense of, um, you're gonna miss them. Yeah, and we thought that was gonna be it. We thought that once they left, the story was done, and it wasn't. It, it continues to resonate. We never thought that there would be any attention brought to us or what happened that day, and it just continues as a legacy piece. Now you mentioned legacy, Gina, and what's very interesting about this is, of course, the story of what happened here in 9-11 that does continue to go on. And what happened here is being taught in some very interesting and unlikely places around the world. That's coming up after the break.
Welcome back. I'm Anthony Germain. Well, when we think back to 9-11, it's very difficult to imagine back then that any kind of event would eclipse what happened. And yet here we are living in a global pandemic. And yet despite this pandemic, the legacy of what happened in Gander in this province, it lives on in many, many other countries. And we're going to go now to a school near Houston, Texas, where some people who weren't even born when 9-11 happened are still learning about it. November 11th, the day before, was just like a normal day, right? My name is Madison Hughes. I teach 6th and 7th grade English as a Second Language at Beck Junior High in Katy, Texas. And I got interested in teaching about what happened in Newfoundland when I was in New York City in 2018, seeing the performance come from away. Okay, dream big. Yeah, but what does it mean? Like, you can do what? Hi, my name is Megan Crows. I teach seventh grade at Davila Middle School in Bryan, Texas. I actually got interested in Gander and 9-11 from my best friend, Madison, who does this project with me. Um, she has always been big into Broadway and musicals, and for the longest time, I gave her a very hard time about this. And for my birthday one year, she took me to see a musical, and from then on, I was hooked and decided that I loved this story and we wanted to incorporate it into our classroom. We're trying to hit as many of those teaching standards as we can with this project. So it's really exciting to bring in pieces of Come From Away with drama, bring in personal narratives of people who have written books or spoken publicly about their experiences in Gander. We love to show our kids as much as we can with this project and to get them to see the bigger picture. They are much easier to insert themselves into the story and become a come from away, as most of them weren't born in the United States. Most weren't born, well, all of them weren't, weren't born, born when 9-11 happened. When so. it happened. So we really try to engage them through that, and it just takes on a mind of its own. <laughs> but that's what happened, right? They opened their homes to this, this idea of kindness. From this project, I think what was most important for our students to learn was, you know, everybody is different. And when there are hard times in your life, you can't let those differences define you. Um, you need to come together and help those people, show a lot of compassion, um, show a lot of kindness. Just don't be afraid to, you know, ask a neighbor if they need a helping hand. I would say that's one of the biggest things that I would love for my kiddos to take away from all this. When we started this, you know, we didn't really know what we were going to do with it. You know, we were brainstorming one night and we were like, you know, what? How can we make this a grade? How can we like bring this full circle? And somehow got on the subject of, hey, one of the teaching standards is a friendly letter and kind of turned into, well, why don't we have our kids, you know, write a letter? And then it became, well, who are we going to write a letter to? And um, Without knowing that the people of Gander and Town Hall keep all the letters in a binder, we knew none of that. We um, knew none. We tell everybody okay, who will ask us so, about this. Our students drive this project. You, you know, they're the ones who came up to us and were like, hey, Miss um, Crows, Miss Hughes, we really want to send our letters. We want to um, see what happens. So, I, I mean, we just taught it, and that's really, you know, that's really all we can take credit for. Dear people of Gander, thank you so much for what you did on September 11, 2001. They, they were really kind to the people even though they didn't know them. They really needed something positive that day. For example, when we learned the story, my first thought was gonna, we were going to learn the negative thing. But when Miss Hughes started with the slides and saying like kindness, kindness is the good thing that happened. I would say that, yeah. I would like to thank you again for what you did last year for us and thank you for what you did on 9-11-2001. It's just a period of time where we really need to learn good things or good attitudes to know like how to act 
uh, in the future, it would help us uh, know how to communicate with each other and be kind and uh, choose the right path. I think we have like nine different countries in our classroom, in one room in a building. <coughs> and I can't remember who said it, but they were like, yo, this is like a mini gander, right? In Gander, there were 95, I think, languages spoken in those five days that the plain people were there. They didn't have enough time to learn the language to be able to communicate with everyone, but they were able to show these people through actions and through gestures and words that, you know, you're welcome here, you're safe here. We are celebrating that you are with us and they didn't have to use a specific language to do that. I think so many of those traits um, and little lessons along the way really go far. Okay, if you participated during sixth grade. From what I see, they really put themselves in the shoes of the plain people. Uh, a lot of my kids remember that first day on American soil when they too were dropped in a place where they couldn't speak the language. They didn't know what people were saying to them. They know that feeling. And so they really pour their hearts out with these letters because it's almost like the kids were there and they know how it feels to be welcomed by someone, to be seen uh, by someone. and. They really take this project on themselves and they are so proud, so excited um, to be a part of it. It really changed the dynamic of my classroom culture. I mean, suddenly my students are quoting, you know, well, what would the people of Gander do if, you know, maybe somebody wasn't being the kindest kid in class um, or using Mayor Claude and Captain Beverly Bass um, as their helps examples and their essays that they would write, um, bringing in that historical knowledge into their writing. So I think for me, it was, I was kind of mind blown of like, wow, they really, they took this story and they ran with it and it didn't stop after we taught it. It, it kept going in everything that we did. So there you have, interesting, the very start of the school year in the United States. They're actually talking about this place and, and where we are right now. Brian, uh, you're an educator for more than three decades. More than three decades, 31 years, yeah. What are your thoughts about something like this? It's so amazing, and I've, I've always loved seeing the extras being done in the classroom. And, and these two teachers that we just watched are doing that, you know, and they're showing through doing the extras an appreciation for what happened. It's also nice to see that, you know, what this town and the people in this town and surrounding areas did is something that you'd want to teach the kids as, you know, something that was really, really nice. Obviously, that wasn't going through our heads 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, when it has become a part of something that you want to learn about, it's amazing to see it being taught in schools so far away. It's also interesting that given the way uh, teachers might approach 9-11 in the United States, that there's there's one place where there's a focus outside, because one might think, you know, that the focus would be on the horrible things that happen in New York and Washington. Gina, what are your thoughts? I, I, I can't uh, express the pride I feel watching something like that uh, as a Newfoundlander and Labradorian and try not to get emotional. But the people here are amazing. We've eked out centuries of living on this rock by facing either man-made or natural disasters by coming together. And to see something like that and realize that we as a people are being held up as an example for children. As a mom, I tell my kids every day, well not every day, but frequently, <laughs> I say try to make this world a better place because you're in it. And that those teachers are doing that and we're being held up as an example mm -hmm. of that. I, it's beyond words. And I think also during this time of the global pandemic, so many of us have been stressed, um, not feeling ourselves, the, the anxiety, you know, some people call it plague fatigue. And yet when you look back at this, there's actually something for, for people in Gander, and actually all Canadians, to actually feel good about how we responded to this horrible dark day uh, when the United States was hurt so badly. Brian? 
It's, it's amazing what kindness can do and how far the word of your kindness will travel. You know, and it's so easy to do, mm -hmm. and it's free. You know, a smile, a hug, letting somebody know you care about them. And I think that was the basis where we started that day. It's it's and easy to do, but it's hard in this time right. because never, I think, in so many years, has there been such a divide. Um, so kindness like that can just make such a difference in human connection. Yeah. Now, you noticed in that story as well, there were kids in that class from all over the world. Well, Gander's face has changed a bit in 20 years with other people coming here because of kindness. My name is Talal Ibrahim. I came with my family from Turkey uh, to Canada in 2016, just in September. So it's now five years. I lived in Homs in Syria, and in 2011, the revolution started. And I call it revolution because people were protest against the president. And after that, it turned to be war. And it was really very ugly war. So uh, I left Syria in 2015. Uh, we, we reached to the point, me and my wife, you know, we can't handle it anymore. We were in the, in the area where under government control, but it isn't safe, you know, the mortars was falling every day. When we came to Canada as refugees, we were seeking for a place of safe, you know, safe country, a peaceful country, and we find all that in Canada. When I arrived to Gander, after two months, they have this show come from away. And we were invited, and I didn't have any idea what it's about. And I just realized that it's about the passenger who landed in Gander airport and who were received very welcome uh, by the people of Gander. And the experiment repeated itself after 20 years when people of Gander received us too. Uh, they were very kind, they were very friendly with us. When you walk on the street, you know, you see everyone saying hi to you, you know, and if you are in trouble, and for example, you're stuck in snow in, in the street, you will find many people who are ready, ready to help you. So, uh, I'm so proud to be a member of uh, Gander Town. We have friends here in Gander, they have cabin, and they invited us in summer. So I tried how to live in cabin, and it was fantastic. I tried the quad for the first time. Oh my God, I love it. So I go to the mud, to the, to the, to the lake, you know, I, 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 we love it, the kids love it too. The first year was really difficult for us to adjust it, you know, to adjust with it, you know and got, get settled, but now, if I go to St. John's, for example, I spent a few days, I just, I, I want to come back home. So I considered Gander my home. So, yeah, I think I will live here for long, more than, than expected.
It's time to conclude our special coverage of 9-11 20 years later with some final thoughts from my guests. Gina, what are you thinking about as we conclude? I, I, it, although it's been 20 years, I think it's really important for us to remember that for first responders, survivors of 9-11, there are people still in a lot of physical and emotional pain. And I, I think it's important for them to realize that we're still thinking of them even as you face these things and continue with this, our hearts are with you. And you're talking about people not just in the United States, but also people here, right? Absolutely, there are Canadians. I believe it was 22 Canadians that died that day. There are families still very much impacted in Canada that um, are living this. Every 9-11, they go through all of the feelings and the emotions that they experienced that day. And I think it's important that while we remember in this special the love and kindness that took place, that it was born out of tragedy. And it's important that that's never forgotten. Right. Brian? It's still hard to get your head around the fact that it has been 20 years, two decades since all this happened. Uh, you know, what it was current affairs is now modern history. The oldest student in school would not be born for another two years when this happened. And, you know, that's a long, long time ago. But at the same time, for those of us that were here on the ground, the memories are fresh, they're vivid. You relive moments when you think back and they're there and they're just as fresh as the day they happened. And, you know, not realizing where all this was going to go, certainly we never had time 20 years ago. It's pretty amazing where all this has taken all of us and the sense of pride and, and good feeling that you feel for the place where you live and the surrounding areas. It's almost also reminds me a bit of Remembrance Day in, in a sad sense that some of the people who really helped out 20 years ago, they're not here today. And I noticed going around people talking about what their pop did, what their nan did. And so many of the people who were there, as you point out, Brian, I mean, this, this is actually fading into a historic event and not a, a contemporary one. I think it's also interesting to consider that children like my first two children who were here but don't remember anything about or don't know about it. And it's really our responsibility to make sure that we tell those stories, we keep it fresh, and they understand how pertinent it is in today's world to keep those lessons a part of their lives. An important reminder, as I think we've made the special, that almost like Pearl Harbor or the Kennedy assassination, this is one of those days, if you're our age, you remember it, but there is a generation for whom this was not a memory. That's right. I want to thank you both so much for, uh, for helping us this evening as we look back at uh, 20 years ago. Uh, thank you both very much for being here. Thank you. And thank Anthony, you. we always have the kettle on if you ever want to come here. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> So that's pretty much it for our special. I really hope that you've taken away some inspiration from some of the stories that you've seen tonight. It was a remarkable day and as horrific as it was, there was also uh, some humanity to uh, think about as we look back. Now, some Americans have asked us here in Newfoundland, why would you let perfect strangers enter your house for any reason? And when you talk to people in central Newfoundland and ask that question, they will tell you it's, it's just what we do. I'm Anthony Germain. Thank you so much for watching uh, this evening. We're going to leave you now with some thank yous from, from friends that were made 20 years ago. Hi from Reno, Nevada. My name is Kelly Russell and I was on United Flight 929 on September 11th, 20 years ago. Well, greetings from Auckland, New Zealand. My name is Elias Canaris and I was on United Airlines Flight UA929. Hi, my name is Carrie, and I was flying from Dublin, Ireland to Newark, New Jersey on September 11th. Hello, my name is Stephen Brecker and on 9-11, I was on Virgin Atlantic flight VS-21. Hi, my name is Lynn. I'm from Glasgow in Scotland. I was traveling by myself to Chicago when I landed in Gander. We're uh, Billy, Beth, and Deanna Wakefield from Tennessee. And uh, we were on day 26 of our adoption trip um, on September 11th, 2001. And just before US airspace, we were diverted to Gander. I felt then, as I do now, that on that day, we experienced the worst and the best of humanity. And 20 years later, all I want to say is thank you, Gander. I think of you often. Um, you treated us with utmost kindness and opened your homes and your hearts to us. And for that, I deeply, deeply thank you. And they didn't care about color, religion, and anything. They just were there to help.
if it wasn't for you giving up your time, giving up your food and your homes to us, we would have crumbled. In amongst all the craziness, all I can ever remember feeling was safe and looked after. In some ways, obviously it was the worst time for everybody, but they made a bad time much better for us. So we really do appreciate everything. Anyone I meet till this day, I always tell them the story about my time in Glenwood and in Gander and how fabulous the people were. And I still get choked up thinking about the kindness that was shown to me. And I just want to say thank you to everyone in Gander and Glenwood. Thanks for everything. We appreciate you so much. Bye for now. Your kindness and generosity has never been forgotten. Thank you so much and take care.